Fear is a very real thing. I mean, I know right now, in this kind of setting, you may not fear. There may not be any fear right now. But we all know, as we've experienced in the past, as we've experienced in life, that it could be a very, very real thing. And so I believe it's important for us to recognize, to see what God, how God sees fear and what he would want for us. And as we see the numerous amount of times in the Bible, the characters, the prophets, the people of God dealt with fear. And then how God deals with fear. So it's, it's real important for us to pay attention, to look at the nuggets, to look at the, not just the information, but the application of what we can do in the times in which we get pressed we come under a circumstance in which that fear begins to rise up in you. And you all know what I'm talking about because we've experienced it. And so let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you again for your word, for your powerful word, your alive word, Lord, that continues to help us in every single aspect of life as long as we apply it. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. So this is the second week of a sermon series called Fearless. Fearless. This week we're going to be discussing the future, our future, hopefully with us fearing less. I don't know about you, but sometimes my future, I can fear it. And there are many things that bring about that fear because of some of the things that we're going to be learning today. I remember going to the retreat, and this is kind of interesting because this is a small snippet as to what someone goes with fear, and sometimes you don't recognize it because it happens just like that. I was, I was there, and I saw one of my grandsons. His name's Aiden, and he's, he's, he's about yay tall. He's 13 years old. He's just a regular kid, and so there is this thing called the blob, and you have to climb this 50, about 50-foot 50 tower and then you got to go out to the edge, and at the edge, there's this big balloon-looking thing. They call it a blob. And then you got to jump on this blob. And so when you jump on this blob, then you got to make your way to the edge of the blob. And then a 200-pound man comes, and he jumps where you just landed, and then it sets you, propels you <laughs> 10 feet in the air as your legs and your arms are all waving like this and into the water. This looks like fun when you actually see it. I, I don't want to do it, but this looks like fun. I was like, Aiden, check it out. Do you want to go do that? And he looks up and he goes, no. <laughs> and I'm like, well, why not? It looks high, you know, and I'm like, well, I mean, it's okay. If you, if you decide to do it, do it. If you decide not to do it, well, don't do it. It's fine. So he thinks about it. I can see his little wheels turning in his head. And I look away and say hi to some people. And I'm like, hey, and he's already climbing up the ladder. And so the first sign that his fear that he had, because it was so high, was overcome. So he gets up on the ladder, and he, there's up other people in front of him. <clears throat> so they go. And then I watch him as he looks up around the lake, and then he goes up to the edge, and he looks down, and then he turns back around <laughs> and moves back. The second time that you see him struggling with fear. But this young man got encouraged by all the men that were there, and they were also observing him kind of, you know, oh, my goodness, oh. And they were like, you can do it. You do it. Don't be afraid. Come on, you can do it. And they started cheering him on in that encouragement. He just went, poof, poof. now after that first time, he realized how much fun it was. Guess what he did? Another time, and another time, and another time. And so his fear was gone. But in the beginning, it took a little, a little bit for him to recognize that, oh, this looks like fun, but I'm a little afraid of it. And so this is just a small portion of what fear can do in our lives in a fun environment. Now, let's talk about what fear can do in a completely different environment using some of the examples that the Bible has put some of these characters in a scenario of true fear. <clears throat> Our passage is from Joshua 1, Joshua 1, 6 through 9. 
Joshua 1, 6 through 9. <clears throat> now, let me, <clears throat> let me set the stage for this passage. Joshua was a follower of Moses and observed Moses, the man, the prophet of God, do incredible things. And as he watched and observed and followed his direction, he saw what God has done in the life of Moses. Now, Moses is dead at this time. Moses has passed away. So Joshua is given the mantle, is given the authority by God to continue to take the nation of Israel and lead them over the Jordan River to a land that God has promised the ancestors. So this promise took a long time to happen, but it finally was happening. So Joshua was the one that's supposed to lead them over to the promised land. Now, for those of you who know, when you read the, the book of Joshua, you'll see that there was a lot of battling that was going to come up. There was a lot of warfare that was going to come up. And the enemy was not all human. And that's a big battle that Joshua had to face. And so let me read, <clears throat> let me read from Joshua 1, as I said, 6 through 9, but we're going to focus on one part of this verse, but I want to read the whole verse. Now, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise and go over this Jordan, the river Jordan, you and all the people onto the land in which I have given to them, even the children of Israel. Every place, listen to this, every place that your soul, that the sole of your foot touches, treads on, shall be yours. Imagine that. Imagine that. God speaking to him and saying, wherever you go, wherever you step, that land that you've just stepped in is yours. And so Joshua, I mean, I'm sorry, the verse continues on. <clears throat> and as I said unto Moses, this land will be given to you from the wilderness and to this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea towards the going down of the sun. It all shall be your coast. There shall be no man, this is another amazing point, there shall be no man that will stand before you mm, all the days of your life. As, as, as I was with Moses, so shall I be with you. I will not fail you, Joshua. I will not forsake you, Joshua. And here's a verse that we're going to be focusing on. Be strong and of good courage. And listen to how many times God says this. You have to pay attention when the Bible, when the word of God repeats itself more than one time. It's huge. It's a very important thing. It says, <clears throat> I'm sorry, be strong and be of good courage. For unto these people you shall divide the inheritance of this land that I swore to your fathers to give to them. But only... Be strong and be very courageous, it says. Be very courageous that you may observe everything according to the law of Moses, my servant, that I commanded him. Turn not to the right nor to the left. Now, as we go through this sermon, I'm hoping that you will understand through the distractions or the fears that we have we will turn to the left or to the right when we're supposed to be following God in the straight and narrow road. He says, then you shall be prosper. If you don't turn to the left, you don't turn to the right, then you shall be prosper wherever you go. And this book of the law shall not depart from your side, from your hand. It says, from your mouth. That's huge again because we are expected to know what God says in his word. We're expected to read it. We're expected to tell and witness to other people what God has done and what he says in his word. And so this book of the law should not depart from your mouth. 
how amazing it is that God requires of us to know him in an intimate way that we can verbalize, we can, again, witness what he's done in our lives. <clears throat> and he goes on to say, you need to meditate on it day or night. You need to observe in accordance to everything that is written, and then it will make your way prosperous, and you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong. This is the third time he says this. Be strong. Be of good courage. Don't be afraid. Neither be discouraged because the Lord God will be with you wherever you go. How many times we forget this. How many times do we find ourselves in situations where we forget that God is with us? God goes before us. Now, as you see this story, this section of the Bible of Joshua moving into the promised land, taking everyone through the promised land. For those of you who are in the military or have been in the military and you've been in charge of a troop or a com and commander of other people in general, even if you haven't been in the military and you're in a small group and some come to your Bible study and you are responsible for that, guess what? God has also given you the responsibility over those souls. You're ministering to them. You're ministering to them, and so therefore you do have the responsibility. And now as Joshua obeys G, uh, God, he moves forward, but let's stop right there for a moment, and let's talk about Moses. Moses in Exodus 3, 4. Now, the reason why we're bringing this up, because we, I want to show you, Moses didn't start out being the great prophet of God that he was, that, that we know of. God worked miracles through Moses. But listen to how his beginnings start. And this is found in Exodus 3, chapter 4. 3 and chapter 4. We're just going to be kind of going briefly over some of these things. Now, Moses saw a vision. Moses had a vision. He was out tending to the sheep as he normally would. And he saw a fire. And so he looked and went, huh, there's a flame over there. Let me go see what this flame is. And as he moved closer, he noticed that it wasn't just a flame. It was a bush that was burning. But the interesting part about it that he noticed, he said, wait a minute, this is a strange sight. This bush is burning, but the bush is not being consumed. Here is the power of God. God is a consuming fire, but yet we can be in the presence of this consuming fire and not be consumed. The power of God. And so as he saw the sight, he moved to it, and God spoke to him. He said, Moses, come here. Come here, Moses. Well, I would be scared to death. Talk about fear. <laughs> and you hear this voice, and you're like tiptoeing over there. Okay, I'm hearing this voice. Oh, my goodness. And so he goes through the, through the uh, understanding of, look, you're on hollow ground. <laughs> You're in my presence. Take, take the sandals off your feet. Be in my presence as I've made you to be. And so God begins to have this dialogue with Moses about what he needs Moses to do. A lot of times we've been asked, perhaps in ministry, perhaps at our jobs, to do something that goes beyond our comfort zone, and we kind of go, well, I don't know. Well, it comes with a bonus. It comes with an increase in your pay. Okay, we're fearless at that time, but nevertheless, God gives him this instructions of what he needs to do. But not only what he needs to do, now get this. Moses is supposed to go before the most powerful man on earth at that time, Pharaoh. Pharaoh of Egypt, the most powerful man on earth in this region. I need you to go to him, and by the way, I need you to also tell him a couple of things. And I need you to tell him these things exactly like I tell you because this is important. He needs to know who is the God above all gods. And so speak to him and let him know who sent you, the I am who sent you. Now, Moses is giving power. 
he's, he's given the privilege to utilize the power of God. God sees a staff in Moses' hand, and he says, what is that that you're holding? He goes, it's, it's a staff. He goes, throw the staff down. And the staff, as, as some of us know, turns into a serpent. Very odd, isn't it? There's a reason why that staff turns into a serpent, and I'll tell you in just a minute. So he picks it back up again. God tells him to pick it back up again, picks it back up, and it turns back into a staff. That's power sign number one. This is a sign, this is the power of God that Moses was supposed to take to Pharaoh and show that God is a powerful God above your gods. And so the second sign that Moses was given the privilege to wield <clears throat> was the power of healing. See, God told him to take his hand and put it in his coat, jacket. And then when he put it in his hand, he took it out. It was leprous. It was white. It was just, eh. And so it's like, oh, my goodness. And he says, put it back in your lapel. Put it back in your coat. And he did. And he took it back out, and it was healed again. Again, a serpent, the power of healing. And then the last one, he asked him to take a bowl of water or some water and pour it onto the dirt, onto the ground. And the water transformed itself into blood. Three significant signs that we have to understand. Now, this is, this is a side note. This is not the point of the sermon series, but I want you to understand how intricate God is and how much he knows about what's going on in high places. Now, the serpent in Pharaoh's court, I don't know if you're familiar with the dress hair that Pharaoh would wear. It had a serpent on the end of it. And that serpent represents a lot of things, but mainly it represents protection, authority, and power. That's what the serpent represented for the Egyptians. How amazing it is that God chose to transform that staff to a serpent, and then when you read the story, guess what happens? The serpent that God has, that Moses threw that staff down, the magicians of Pharaoh were able to reproduce that same power, that same sign, but the serpent that Moses, the serpent that the staff turned into on Moses' side swallowed up the other serpents, indicating the authority that God, that God had over the authority of Pharaoh. Now, Moses went about Asking, telling Pharaoh to let the people of God go. As a matter of fact, the story goes on to say, look, you got to let my people go. You don't understand. These people are my firstborn. These are my firstborn people. You've got to let them go. Now, Moses utilized a lot of signs, a lot of signs to press Pharaoh to letting the people go. Now, Pharaoh continued to harden his heart against God, and you have to remember how many times did God help us in showing us different signs, bringing us different people, having us go through certain things, but yet we continue to miss the sign, or even worse, harden ourselves against what God is trying to do. But eventually, as we know the story, Pharaoh gave in and said, look, take your people and go before we all die. The last sign, as, as I'm sorry, let me, let me finish that second sign. The second sign was the power of healing. And that power, he was able to afflict the nation of Egypt with numerous amount of diseases, numerous amount of pestilence. Amazing again how God knew to give these three special signs to be able to do all these things to Moses. And the last one is that water turning into blood. The whole river, the whole river in the Nile, the Nile River was turned into blood at one time. So significant that new, a whole people, a whole species of, of, of things died because of it. Things came out of the river and was all over the land, causing havoc all over the place. But I think the important part of it turning into blood is the sign of the blood of the Lamb that was going to cover one day all the sins of his people. 
God is amazing in the way that he does certain things. And I love the fact that even after he gave all these signs to Moses, you got to see the response of Moses in which he would come with excuses and justifying himself because, God, you can't send me. you got to send somebody else. you got to, you got to. No, not me. I'm not the guy that you need. I am not the guy that you want to send. I can't speak. How am I going to go before Pharaoh and speak? I don't even know how to speak. I fumble through my words. I can't speak right. So much so that he kept going with excuses after excuses. It, it angered God. God was angry and said, look, okay, I'm still going to send you, but I'm going to send somebody with you. Aaron was sent with him to help him to be his spokesman but yet the authority was given to Moses to do all these things so that the people of God will be set free now imagine Moses beginnings of how he made up this excuses how he how he was intimidated by the way that his character was his flaws or I should or as I should say his fear of inadequacy God desires for us to know how we are and who we are, but to overcome the fears that we have within us of all our inadequacies. I'm not educated. I can't take that position. I don't have the education to do it. I, I really don't know how to handle so many people. I don't even know how to handle my own family sometimes. But yet God calls us to overcome all of our fears of not being or even feeling good enough it's important it's important to god it's important for him to see us surrender those things to him because our future depends on it the future that god has for us depends on it ephesians 2 10 tells us this and this is just a reminder to us that God desires to encourage us through his word so that we can remember in the back of our heads how valuable and important we are to him. Ephesians 2.10 says this, For we are, we are God's handiwork. We have been created in Christ Jesus to do what? Bad things. Mediocre things. Somewhat kind of things. Good works. God has made us, his handiwork has created us, some of us tailor-made for these good works in which who has prepared in advance? God himself has prepared these things. Imagine you were created with a purpose. God didn't make you just because. You weren't an accident. However way you see yourself or anybody else, The person was not created by accident. God has specifically made you for a purpose, has specifically in advance planned it out that we will walk in that purpose, not turn into the left or to the right. Sometimes our inadequacies and our feelings of how things are in our lives or even worse, what we've experienced, because experience is a killer sometimes, you don't, know who, you don't know what I've been. You don't know where I've been. I'm this way because, and then you'll spell it out just like Moses. We're the same way. We all have these fears. We all have these uh, inadequacies. We all feel like we're not good enough sometimes. Where does this stem from? Where does this come from? I mean, I, I want to challenge us to really dig into Dig into why and where these things come from in your life. If you have not done so, please understand that God desires for you to know, first of all, Him, and second of all, yourself, so that we can continue to do what He's prepared us to do in advance, brother, in advance to do these good works. And so these fears of inadequacy, I believe, stems from a place of self-sufficiency. Meaning, I can do this. I got this. I can do these things. And you know what? There's nothing wrong with doing things and doing it to the best of your abilities. There's nothing wrong with having some kind of self-sufficiency. But when you are trying to implement 
God's plan, God's way, and God's purpose, you got to go beyond your self-sufficiencies. Because guess what? We need him just like Moses needed him, just like Joshua needed him. And the power and the presence of the living God working in us, working miracles sometimes through us to do the works he's called us to do. Self-sufficiency sometimes comes from this, this, I want to do it myself. I want to attempt to do these things. I want to try to do. How many of you have tried to do ministry on your, in your own strength? How many people have tried to counsel people over and over and over again in your own strength? Let me tell you, that gets exhausting. It gets exhausting because I, I don't know about you, but sometimes when I do things in my own strength, all I see is all the bad stuff. All, all I get, Lord, is all the bad stuff. I get all the bad stuff. I don't understand why I get all the bad stuff. Well, you're looking in the wrong direction first. Or you're, you're looking to the left and you're looking to the right. You're not seeing my purpose for that individual. That I am using you as a catalyst to help them move in their maturity in Christ. But if you look at it through that lens, I guarantee you, you're going to be exhausted. You're going to be frustrated. You're going to go, ay, 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 people. People, 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 Lord. Why you love us so much? But again, these things have to be searched out because knowing your limitations is very, very important. Not Merely knowing about your limitations. I mean, have you ever not even considered doing something just because you just didn't think you could do it? You never really tried it, but you said, ah, I can never do that, so I'm not even going to try. You have never even tried it, but yet you've never done it. You don't know. There is a point in which you have to know your limitations, but at least try those things out before you say I really can't do that because I've tried and I've tried and I've tried and I just can't do it. it is, it's important to know our limitations. I think it's very healthy. I think it's a godly thing for us to get to the point of our limitation. Get to the point of, I can't do it anymore. But the bad section part of getting to that point is sometimes we wallow in the failure we say to ourselves, well, you know what? I tried. I'm good with it. I'm all right with it. And you tell people that, but and then it festers in your mind. It plagues you in your mind. It messes with your mind. You think about it. You stress about it. You, you create scenarios. Even after that scenario, you create even greater scenarios. I love my wife, but my wife, if she was here now, she would tell you she does exactly that. She will take a little, little failure, and then in a couple of days, it'll be this huge rock landing on her, and we have to go back to the beginning. Honey, it was just, it's okay. It was just this big until she understands how to deal with her limitations. And I think, again, it's very healthy for us to get to a point, I would say, to have the opportunity to fail. You know why? Because we have the opportunity to ask God to help us, to speak and ask God and pray to him, knowing, God, there is nothing more I can do with my family. There is nothing more I can do with these kids besides kill them. But, of course, that's wrong. You do know it's wrong, right? <laughs> Please, Lord, help me. Give, you've been there? Help me. Give me some knowledge. Give me some patience. Oh, don't ask for patience. You'll get more of the same. <laughs> but I think it's an opportunity for us to get to a point where we can't do it anymore. Have you pushed yourself to that limit? whether in your field of expertise or just in life in general, have you pushed yourself to the point that, man, I am tapped out, I can't, I don't have any more, no more strength, no more power in my own strength. That's when you go, God, God, I know you're with me. Your word tells me that you're with me, that you'll never forsake me, that you'll never leave me. 
And how close is he to you? Right there, right under your breath. That small prayer that you pray that no one else gets to hear but you and God saying, Lord, I really need you right now. I need your, I need your presence. I need your power. How amazing it is that we get the opportunity, but not only to stop there, but God desires to give us more and more and more because his ability has no end. His power has no cap. And it's constant. And it's always. But knowing our limitations is important. We're going to talk about some things that we go through in three different areas. And, and most of you are probably very familiar with this, but I want to go over important that we understand. Our limitations are not just confined to activities. It could be a physical limitation. You can have physical limitations. There are some people that can do things. I have a little buddy of mine. He's about this big, but yet he's this wide. <laughs> he's a little guy, but man, he walks around like he's 10 foot tall. He's, he's just a huge guy. I would hate to have to work out with him because my little measly 90 pounds, <laughs> he would probably take a finger and go, really, Julio? His limitations are way beyond mine, but we do have some physical limitations. Our bodies have these the weaknesses and, and some points of failure, and, and, and it causes us to do several things. One of them is to flee a lot of times, and specifically when fear sets in. It's just a natural response. Please understand. It's a natural response when you fear something and you're afraid of a situation, your body's going to go, get out of here, leave, run. That's just natural. The other thing that it does is it wants to fight whatever it is that you're fearing. You don't even understand what it is. I don't know what it is, but you know what? I'm going to punch it in the mouth. I'm going to fight this thing. That's a natural response of the body when it's faced with this fear that we don't understand or is coming from somewhere or someone or, or a circumstance. We just naturally do the want to fight part or you just stand there and you're like, Zoop. I'm not really here. It's like a little kid that covers his face at night in the dark. I'm not really here. You don't see me. Natural responses. Natural responses, but imagine you doing one of those at the wrong time because of the fear you have not overcome, and it's the wrong response. This is the importance of us recognizing that in times when we freeze, when we want to fight, perhaps you weren't supposed to fight, we ask God to come into our lives knowing that he's there, knowing he's going to answer us, knowing he's going to help us. The other one is mental. We talked a little bit about mental, how our mind plays with this fear, not just our own minds. I don't know about you guys, but I don't need the enemy to mess with me any more than my own mind messes with me. I don't. But guess what? Do you think he's going to go, oh, no problem, Julio, go right ahead. Go, ahead. go right ahead. Hinder yourself. Well, I do that on my own, but he doesn't like that because he wants to kill, he wants to steal, and he wants to make sure that I am destroyed. And so he's going to take my own insecurities, my own inadequacies, my own fears, and he's going to press on until there's no more Julio. Mental mental things that happen in our minds of failures. Perhaps you've had experiences of so many failures about certain things in your life that it, it's just instilled in you. It just comes out naturally like the other three we talked about. Or perhaps you've had some trauma in your life. You ever got into a car accident and you went by that same site and you kind of responded or you reacted? Or something happened equivalent to that thing that happened and you find yourself like reacting to it? That's a trauma. Perhaps someone has lied to you for so long to keep you in check, to keep you in your box, keep you, and you've believed it. And now you identify with it, and you carry it everywhere you go. What's your name? I'm fear. I'm fearful. That's who I am. I'm timid. I don't, I don't speak out. I, I'm pulling out the badge, just so we're clear. Spiritual. 
spiritual fear. That's another, another section in which some of us need to recognize what the limitations are, what we have in reference to our spiritual limitations. I believe the plan of God and the purpose of God have timing. They have timing. And sometimes when we get fearful, we abandon the patience that we have for the timing of God and replace it with something else, thinking that that's God. I'll give you an excellent example. (coughs) You confuse an emotional, I'm sorry, you confuse a spiritual experience that creates an emotional response and you think it's spiritual because of your emotional response to it. And even worse, you move through your life or your walk with God desiring this emotional experience and then call it spirituality. It's confusing sometimes. But these how these how these are how we need to pay attention where we are what we think about, what we're doing, and how we're doing it in order to understand how to obey God's plan. Obedience and obey God's plan. Remember, God will never abandon you. God will never isolate you. He always brings like-minded people alongside you. I have two of the best friends that I've ever had in my life sitting here today, and they've been with us since the very beginning. As a matter of fact, this morning, I was so compelled to say thank you for always being present, for listening to God and being obedient to be present, to be a support for me and my wife, to be an encouragement for me and my wife. It's an amazing thing. God never desires for us to be alone, even from the very beginning. He says it's not good for man to be alone. That's why he created families. And they're precious to him. Listen to this verse where Matthew 18, 20, where he says, when there are two people, when there are two or more people gathered in the name of Jesus, guess where he is? Right in the midst of them. That's all it takes is one or two or three people that God says, man, I am there. I'm there. Let's move on. One of the important parts of recognizing, knowing our limitations, seeing how how God has shown us through the numerous amount of stories that he gives us. Yes, the stories have different things in them, but this particular one we're focusing on Moses' weaknesses, Moses' inadequacy, so that we can know for ourselves that God is desiring to show us that we are limited, that we have failures and we have inadequacies because we also need to understand and recognize the mission of God. That is top priority, the mission of God. And if you miss this, as I said earlier, you will go to the left or you will go to the right. It's important for us to stay on mission with God, recognizing the mission of God. And what is the mission of God? We can find one of these. We're only going to cover two, but we can find one of these in Matthew 28, 19 through 20. It says, therefore, go. Don't freeze. Don't freeze because of fear. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, not just the neighbor down the street, not just in our community, all nations, it says. And you know what? Maybe God will send you. You don't know. Maybe God will send you. Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Spirit teaching them to obey obedience, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded. How interesting. Did it not just say in Joshua 1, make sure you obey everything that I'm telling you. Make sure you pay attention to what I'm saying. Don't let this book fall from your memory. Speak it. The Word of God is alive. The Word of God is powerful. 
speak the word of God in every situation and you will see the power of God in your life. Teaching them to observe, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And here we go again. And surely I will always be with you. How many times has the Lord spoke and said, I am with you. I will go before you. I will be there with you. I will, I, mm, how many times? And here he goes on to even go further and says, not only will I be with you, but I'll be with your children and their children just like he was with Moses and Joshua because he made a promise to them. He made a promise to the ancestors. And so therefore he can say till the end, to the end of what I have accomplished, I will accomplish it to the end of the age. So you may not get to see the fruitfulness of everything that you have poured out your heart, whether into your family or into your ministry, but know this, the promise of God stands to the end of the age, that he will be with you, your children, your grandchildren, and so on and so forth. Praise be to God. John, not this guy here. Hey, wake up. John 16, 7. He can handle it. 7 through 8. But verily I tell you, this is another mission of God. This, remember the blood I was talking about? The sign of water turning into blood, how important it was not only for Pharaoh to see that something as lively as a river that brought him, brought them a lot of things, brought him product, product, produce, product from other places to their lands, to their shore. So they lived off this river, but now it's turned to blood. Verily I tell you the truth, it is good that I am going to weigh. This is, this is Jesus speaking. Unless I go, the advocate will not come. The mission of God, the purpose of God, why he came to die on a cross, not only in replacement for us that should have died on that cross, but now the promise of the Spirit that it's, look, I have to go. Because if I don't go, then I can't send. I have to go. I will send him to you, the advocate. And when he comes, he will prove the world to be wrong about sin, about righteousness, and most of all, about judgment. Listen to that. The righteous judge saying sin will be judged. And the world has got it wrong. And the spirit that I'm sending to you will minister to you and tell you these things for yourself. (sighs) Thank you, Lord. We must understand the mission of God. It is imperative for us to know it, to do it, to pursue it, and to follow it. What is the trend that we're seeing in Joshua 1 verse 9 that we read? What is the trend that we're seeing in Matthew 28, 20? What is the trend that we're seeing in John 16, 7 through 8? What, what are we looking at here? When we see and we experience and know the mission of God, it is impossible for us to fail even when we fear. Did you hear what I said? When we understand the mission of God, it is impossible for us to fail because it's not us. It's not our mission. Even when we're fearing the mission. Let's move on. We also have to understand the provisions of God. And this is important because a lot of times we ask, well, how am I going to do that? Well, where's that coming from? So how am I going to live off of this? 
we have these questions. We go through these things whenever something comes about, whenever we take on something. All of these things come about. But God wants us to understand that when we take stock of the many and numerous amount of times that he's provided for his people, for his prophets, for his nation in supernatural ways sometimes. God doesn't always have to act in a supernatural way to do things. Sometimes you're in need, and all of a sudden you will meet the right person at the right time, and guess what they have for you? That gift from God that you have been asking or praying for. But it's important for us to recognize, taking stock into God's provision by understanding that our fears don't dictate those things. And, and let me give you a small example, and I have gone through this personally. That's why I can sit here and talk about these things. Oh, sorry. Maybe we don't have time for that story. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We need, we need to move on because we have another 20 slides. That's kidding. We have another few slides. I, I did want to go there, but I, I cannot go there. Recognizing the provision of God. First of all, in our basic needs, our basic needs. Those basic needs, I hope you understand, are being met by God. And we're going to go over three verses that prove and show us that we can depend that our basic needs will be met by God. First one being Deuteronomy 29.5, where it says, For 40 years I have led you in the wilderness. This is that time in which Joshua took them over the river Jordan and they dwelt and they wandered all over the land. For 40 years, you have been, I have been leading you through the wilderness. Your clothes, your clothes have not worn out. I want one of these jackets. I want one of these shirts. I don't know about you, but my shirts wear out. I have one with a hole right now. I think that was a moth, though. Your shoes, your shoes will not wear out. 40 years. Goodness, market that. I'll pay whatever. Basic needs being meant, Philippians 4.19. And, and my God will meet all of your needs according to the riches of his glory in Jesus Christ. Matthew 6.26, our basic needs being met. Now look at the birds of the field. I love looking at birds in the fields. I just, it's one of, nature is one of my favorite things to observe. Look at the birds in the fields. They don't sow. They don't reap. They don't gather into barns and save for themselves for a rainy day. But yet the Father, our Heavenly Father, takes care of them. He makes sure that they are fed. How much more you who are more important are made in the image, in the image of God. How much more do you not think he's going to take care of you? The second provision that we must understand is a clear passage. Now, please don't misunderstand. A clear passage means that there is a direction, that there is a vision, that you see it, but it's not always safe. I'm sorry, but it's not always safe. But yet God promises deliverance from us to us. Psalms 34, 4 through 10. Excuse me one second. This, I'll look it up. Psalms 34. If you have your Bibles with you, turn to Psalms 34. You've got to read this. This is beautiful. Starting in verse 4 through verse 10. I sought the Lord... I sought the Lord, and, I, and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. They looked upon him and were delighted. They were lightened, and their faces were not covered with shame. This poor man cried unto the Lord, and he heard him. He saved him out of all of his troubles. The angel of the Lord encampers around them that they fear him. The ones that fear him, he encampers around them. He delivers them. Taste and see the goodness of the Lord. Taste 
That's a very strong thing. Sometimes we have a taste. I can't stand onions. So when I taste an onion in my food, I will spit it out. I know I'm a kid. I'm sorry. I don't like onions. But it says, because I know how strong taste is. We know how strong taste is. I love the language that he's using here. Taste how good the... Hey, you settle down over there. Now I got to defend my heritage. I don't like spicy food either. I have lost the crowd. Oh, man, where was I? Taste and see the goodness of the Lord. Bless is the man that trusts in the Lord. Trust, man. How many times have we chosen to trust God, but yet we have conditions? Oh, God, I want to give you my whole life. Everything belongs to you, but however, and then here comes the conditions. I wouldn't call that trust. <laughs> I would call that manipulation. <laughs> Trying to get God to do what you want him to do by saying, I'll trust you. And don't get me wrong. I do it. I do it. I'm getting better at it. But those who do trust him. Amazing Psalms 34. Read the whole thing for yourself. God gives us clear passage. He grants us clear passage. He told Joshua, every single step that you take at every single place that you go is yours. Clear direction. Clear passage. Rest. I love sleeping. <laughs> Come on, everybody. I love rest, and I'm glad that God commands it. <laughs> I am so glad God commands for us to rest, and it is important for us to know. As a matter of fact, it's the fourth commandment in the Ten Commandments. It's kind of up there. <laughs> I love rest, but listen to what God, listen to what Jesus said. I want you to hear the compassion in his, in his words in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28, when he says, Come to me all who are weary and are heavy laden. Man, sometimes I feel like that when I'm hopping from one place to another. And then I get home and think I can take off my clothes and just enjoy myself and just relax. And my wife says, don't forget, we have to put my pants back on, put my shirt back on, and go off again. Y'all been there, right? You think you can go home and just get on YouTube and no, 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 no. No. Something happened to the child. I got to go get him. Something happened to the neighbor. Something happened to my cousin. Something, my grandma's calling me. What? Oh, rest is so important. Those who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You ever had that kind of rest, and it may have only been a short amount of time, but you slept good. I love those kind of rest. Sometimes I could sleep for 10 hours. I don't normally sleep for 10 hours. But sometimes I can sleep for a long period of time and wake up just as tired as when I went to bed. Or sometimes I can sleep for three to four hours and, man, God puts me in that deep, restful place knowing that I need it, knowing that it's essential for me, that he has commanded for me to rest. And I reach that state and I wake up just a few hours later and I feel good. I love that. I love it. Unmatched generosity, number four. Unmatched generosity. And we got to move along really fast with these. <clears throat> God pours out his blessing upon us, so much so that in Malachi 3.10, he tells God is speaking through Malachi, and he's telling, he's telling the people, look, bring all your tithing into the storehouse. Why do you need my money? So that there be, may be meat in my house. Now, meat doesn't mean we're going to be cooking steaks and pork chops out back. Meat means that we're going to be able to minister to people on a regular basis through the resources that you guys give so that we can get busy about doing the mission of God. Amen. So that there may be meat for us to feed people. And test me in this, he says. Test me. This is God speaking. Test me if I don't open a window in heaven and go, 
pour that blessing onto them for doing that. So much so that you're not going to be even able to contain it, it says. <laughs> Our God's blessing never ends. Never ends. I love the book of Malachi. Read it for yourself. And the last one is number five, the means to eternal life. Now, I want you to understand eternal life has been offered. It was offered by Jesus Christ. It was paid. The price for the penalty of sin was paid by Jesus Christ so that we could be set free by the blood of the Lamb so that we can have eternal life with Him. But yet it was offered all the way back to the book of Genesis. Because if you remember in the book of Genesis, there were several trees. As a matter of fact, God says, out of all the trees in the garden you can eat, Adam, all of them, except for this one. Don't touch it. Don't look at it. Don't get away from it. Okay? Just don't, don't, don't look in that direction. But out of all these other trees you can eat from, guess what was in the midst of all these other trees? The tree of life. The tree of life. Not just the tree of life, but the bread of life. The source of life. He was referring to Jesus, the life giver. If you dwell with me, I will dwell with you. If you feast with me, I will feast with you. If you love me, you will obey my commandments, my word. And as you eat, we will be one. It's amazing. Listen to me. It's amazing that God chose to write his laws into our hearts. He chose to engrave his word, his alive and powerful word into our minds because he wants to be an intimate God with us. He wants to love us from the inside as well as from the outside. Eternal life was offered to us all the way back in the garden. Now we know the rest of the story and if you don't know the rest of the story, get a Bible, open it up, look at the book of Genesis. Read, read and continue to feast on the word of God. Now real quick, I wanna, want us to take a look at some of the times, some of the times in which Man were put in situations that they should fear, but overcame this fear. Look at Noah building the ark. A hundred plus years to build this ark because God was going to destroy the whole earth. Don't you think that would be a fearful sight to see? But yet the man was faithful enough to spend over a hundred years building this ark because he trusted God. And here you have the Red Sea parting for Moses. Don't you think they would have feared going through seeing a sea that at any time, not knowing at any time, they could go whoosh, just like it did for Pharaoh. It'd be fearful to do that, but yet they crossed it. Joshua going into the river. This was a little bit different. The rivers parted. The Jordan River parted, but it didn't part beforehand. It parted because God instructed them, gave them instructions to say, you've got to go through the river first. Meaning you've got to step through. Now imagine you are going through a river and it's getting higher and higher and you're wondering what's going to happen. Are we going to swim across this river? No. But as they obeyed God in the direction of God, then the waters parted and they were able to get to safe passage. Baptisms. Baptisms. Being baptized. Because here you are proclaiming that you are surrendering your life to follow Jesus Christ. It is a public proclamation that you are making to everyone who's looking. And the fearful part is that you are choosing to follow. You can come up, Skylar. You're choosing to follow Jesus Christ in a world completely contrary to everything that you've just surrendered to. Is there fear in that? Can there be? Absolutely. But we are called to overcome our fears. We are called to build that ark. We're called to cross that sea. We're called to be faithful to God. Look at Peter in the last example we're going to use. Peter saw Jesus walking on water. 
And he wanted to be out there with him because it is the will of God for us to be together with him. And he says, Lord, call me on to yourself and I will come out. And God says, come on. Come on, Peter. What do you think? You think you're going to step on water? What is your mind going to say when you step on that water? I don't know about you, but I'm thinking I'm going to sink. But Peter overcame his fear knowing what was going to happen in his mind knowing the physics of water but he stepped out of the boat and guess what happened he was walking on water because he overcame his fear now we know the rest of the story but yet i want you to remember god has not called us to completely eradicate fear from our lives but he has called us to overcome it in any situation that we get. Don't be led by fear. Don't be ruled by an emotion called fear. Stand, me, stand with me if you're able. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the fearless sacrifice of your son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in which he went to a cross and he bore his soul and his blood for the remissions of my sin, Father, of the sins of the world, to give us a freedom not to live in the lie and the captivity of this emotion, this thing called fear, but to overcome as he did, as he conquered, not just the grave, but all things, through the power of obedience for a calling that you have purposed, Father. And as you purpose those things in our lives, Father, we will observe them. We will know our limitations. We will surrender our inadequacies. And we will replace our fears with the trust and the faith that we have in you because we know that you are a great and capable God. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for your blessings as we go today. Let us continue to speak boldly in your name and be the witness.